so I'm going to be talking to you about uh, a more forward-looking project, um, which we call uh, IRMA, or IRMA if you pronounce it uh, as an American, uh, which stands for uh, I Reveal My Attributes. And this is a project that SurfNet has been doing together with one of our universities, the Radboud University in Nijmegen. And actually, I am part of the research group that um, does this work. And um, IRMA is a very privacy-friendly authentication technology. Uh, and I'm going to be talking you through how privacy friendly it is in this presentation, and I will show you a demo of the technology. The partners in the project is not just the Radboud University, but also TNO, that's the Netherlands Organization for Applied Scientific Research, and uh, SIDN, which is the top level registry for the .NL uh, internet domain. Now, first of all, before we start out, um, we need to define what is an attribute. And those of you who are familiar with identity federations will already know what an attribute is. Um, and it's actually a property uh, of a person. So it can be something like your name, or it could be the fact that you're a student or a staff member, or it could be another bit of information about you, for instance, that you are over 18, or it could be something very much identifying like your social security number. And we are already using these attributes. As I mentioned, these should be familiar to people who live in the federated identity space. Um, identity federations are built on attributes. And um, we rely on protocols like SAML to um, supply attributes from an identity provider to a search provider to authenticate users and to authorize users. So, this diagram shows you uh, a more abstract view of how we use attributes in authentication. At the top of the diagram, you see an issuer of attributes, and that's an authoritative source uh, with information about a group of users. And this could be your home IDP if you're in an institution, or it could be your state government who has a database of all the citizens living in the state. Um, at the center of the diagram is the user uh, uh, herself. Uh, and at the right-hand side of the diagram, you see the relying party who will rely on attributes about the user to give them access to uh, a service. And in the, the federated identity world, um, an issuer is called an identity provider and a relying party is called a service provider. Now, if a user wants to authenticate to a relying party because they want to access some sort of resource or they want to access a service, they will um, go to their issuer of, uh, of attributes. They will ask them to give uh, a signed uh, set of attributes uh, that they can then use to prove to the relying party that they are who they, are say, who they say they are. Now, there is an inherent problem in this. There are two kinds of attributes. There are non-identifying attributes, for instance, the fact that I'm over 18, but there are also identifying attributes, for instance, your name, your social security number, etc. cetera. Um, and in the traditional setup, so in identity federations, users have very little control over their privacies. Um, all the decisions about which attributes are going to be released uh, are sort of agreements between identity providers and service providers, and the user has very little control over this. And in some identity federations, this uh, situation is improving because we are introducing things like user consent, uh, which is something that we uh, as SurfNet are doing in our identity federation. Um, but we are still quite reluctant to do this because um, we started out with a situation where we didn't have this, uh, and it takes a little bit of getting used to for, for instance, our institutions that they now have to relinquish some control to users. And the same is true for service providers. They'd much rather talk to one authority uh, than having to have all these users con uh, control what they're going to re reveal or not. So now I'm going to zoom in on the IRMA technology uh, and show you how IRMA can be uh, both a strong form of authentication but give much more control to the user and improve their privacy. Now IRMA is based on a technology that's called IDEMIX and IDEMIX was developed by IBM in Zurich uh, in the research laboratory there um, and it's based on uh, a research by two uh, uh, cryptographic researchers, Jan Kamenisch and Anna Lysianskaya. Um, and it's an extremely privacy-friendly, attribute-based authentication technology that gives the user a lot of control. And it has some key properties. Um, the first key property is non-transferability. So if I, as an issuer, if I issue 
an identity to a user, I don't want them to be able to copy this to other users so they can uh, uh, perform identity fraud. So the identity has to be protected very strongly, and that is called non-transferability. Another um, property of the technology is that it provides issuer unlinkability. And what does that mean? Issuer unlinkability means that the issuer of the identity doesn't know where it gets used. So, um, for instance, if your government issues you an identity card and you use it somewhere, you don't want them to, to be able to, to see that you used it to prove you're over 18 while you were renting adult content in your hotel room, which would be sort of a violation of your privacy. Um, and remember that in current identity federations, issuer and linkability is not guaranteed. Your home institution knows where you use your identity if you're logging into a service provider. Um, another uh, um, a property we would like to achieve is what we call multi-show and linkability. And that means that we want to be able to, uh, uh, um, for, we want service providers to be unable to trace users. So if I use the same identity at a number of service providers and they collude to exchange information about logins, I don't want them to be able to trace that it's the same user that was logging into all these services. And similarly, if I log into a single service provider multiple times, I don't want them to be able to trace that it's the same user if that user is using non-identifying attributes. And these properties rely on some novel cryptographic techniques like zero-knowledge proofs and blind signatures. And I'm going to try, and so I'm going to be very brave, I'm going to try to explain one of these to you. And the one I want to explain to you is zero knowledge proofs because that uh, uh, is actually, there's a nice anal uh, analogy for that. What you see on the slide here is a, a very abstract version of Alibaba's cave. Um, on the left hand side is the entrance to the cave and on the right hand side there is a door which is the red line that you can see and there are two paths through which you can reach the door. And we have two actors in this, uh, uh, in this game, Peggy, the prover who wants to prove to Victor, the verifier, that she knows how to open the door, but she wants to do it in such a way that she doesn't reveal how she does that. So what Peggy will do is, yeah, there she goes. She goes into the cave, and then she randomly picks a path to reach the door. And in this case, Peggy will pick path number A. She'll go to the back of the cave, and then Victor will enter the cave as well. And what Victor will do is he will randomly call out one of the two paths and expect Peggy to come back through that path. So in this case, Victor says, please return through path number B. And because she has to open the door, that will prove that she knows how to open the door. But because Victor cannot see the door, he doesn't know how she does that. And Victor says, OK. And we play this game a number of times. So Peggy goes into the cave again. She randomly decides where she wants to go. She chooses path A again. Victor enters the cave again, and Victor randomly calls out, in this case, A. And as you can see, she doesn't have to open the door, but Victor doesn't know whether she had to open the door. And they play this game a number of times. And after about 20 iterations of playing this game, the chance that she can fool Victor into believing that she knows how to open the door when she actually can't do it uh, drops to about one in, uh, uh, over one in a million. And actually, in the Erma technology, so in, uh, in the implementation that we use, we do this uh, not 20 iterations. We do this 2 to the power of 80 iterations. Uh, and we do some clever tricks, so it doesn't take forever to do that. So we can very strongly prove that the prover knows something um, without revealing what the secret is to the verifier. And that is one of the basic building blocks that we use in our technology. Um, now, what we do is we store credentials on a smart card. I've got one here, uh, which I'm going to be using for the demo. And the structure of the credentials is that there is a set of related attributes that are um, signed by the issuer uh, and that are bound together with a secret key. And examples of credentials are, for instance, anonymous credentials could be an age credential that proves that I'm over 12 or that I'm over 21, or that I'm a senior, that I'm over 60, so I can get a reduction when I travel on a train. Um, and on the other hand, we have identifying attributes, such as an address attribute, um, which has my country in it, it has my zip code, etc. 
uh, or a really identifying set of attributes uh, which has my social security number in it, date of birth, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And we store these credentials on, on, as I said, on a smart card. And the interesting thing is that we, we were able to take this technology from IBM and it was implemented on this smart card and operates very quickly. And that was actually uh, a, quite an achievement. Um, and the only identifying information that's on this smart card, and I can prove it because I have one here, so if you want to know, come, come to me after the presentation, I'll show it to you. The only identifying information on here is a photograph of me. There are, my name isn't printed on it. Uh, so if I use it in an offline scenario, I can prove it's my card because the picture matches. Um, but uh, if they make a, a photocopy of this, um, there is no um, identifying information on there that could potentially uh, uh, lead to identity fraud. So I want to, what I want to do now is demonstrate this to you. Um, and um, I'm going to demonstrate two scenarios. And one scenario is an offline scenario where I prove, for instance, when I'm in a bar that I'm over 18. And I'm going to show it to you in an online scenario as well. So if we can, yep. Yeah. I hope you can see the image of the tablet. Just let me grab this. So on the screen, you can see the uh, verifier app. Uh, and it says waiting for card. And this tablet has a, a near field reader in it. And the smart card is a contactless smart card. So it's an NFC smart card. Uh, and if I hold the card to the back of the device, it will start reading the card. It checks my credentials. And to show that I have an over 18 credential, it shows a green tick mark. Um, what the user can do afterward, uh, and unfortunately, I can't show that to you because the letters would be too small on the display. The user can go, thank you. The user can go um, uh, and, what, and see the log of the interactions that the card had. And it will actually show that I revealed my over 18 attribute and nothing else um, to um, this tablet. Now, another demonstration I want to give you, and I'm going to switch to the demo laptop for that, is that I can use this in an online scenario as well. And the demonstration that I have is I want to be able to prove to the New York Times that I'm over 12. Um, there was some commotion about this in the blogosphere and that the um, acceptable use policies of newspapers like the New York Times and the Washington Post require readers to be over 12 because of the content. Uh, which is, of course, completely ridiculous because you want school kids to be able to read a newspaper if they're doing a research project for their, for their school. But um, we can solve this issue because we can prove to the New York Times that I'm over 12. Uh, and what I will do is I will go to the uh, um, logon site, and I'm going to be using a, a smartphone as a remote smart card reader. And, uh, uh, many thanks to Jamie Sunderland from Rnet for lending me his phone to demonstrate this to you. Uh, let me just unlock the phone. And then I'm going to say I want to use my phone as a remote card reader. And it will show me a, a QR code, which I then use to link the two sessions. Uh, as you can see, at the bottom of the screen, it now says verifying. My phone says waiting for card. So I'm now going to do the verification. And suffering from a demo effect. Yes, there we go. Um, I've now proved to um, this website that I'm over 12. And uh, it will now allow me to continue to the website and go to the uh, New York Times site. Oh. And we need an update of the Flash Player. <laughs> uh, so if we can go back to the slide. And we have another very cool demo. Unfortunately, they wouldn't let me bring this to the US uh, because they were scared it might get damaged. But we've actually implemented this technology in a, in a standard point of sales terminal. So uh, uh, one of those mobile point of sales terminal you see in restaurants that people carry around. It has a GSM connection to, to offload payments. And uh, the company that produces these integrated support for um, the Irma technology in the point of sales device. And I can now, um, uh, for instance, if I'm at a merchant, for in, if I'm in a restaurant or wherever, I can prove with my card that I'm uh, uh, over 18 or that I'm a citizen of the Netherlands or whatever I need to prove, and then proceed to do the payment with the same device. 
So that's actually a very cool demo. I really liked it when we got that working. So where are we now with this technology? Well, we're doing a pilot project because we want to learn how this technology behaves if you put it out there and give it to users. Uh, up until now, it's been very much an academic project. And um, the only way to learn what is missing is to hand it over to users and uh, have them break it. So um, we selected a very challenging uh, group of pilot users who are their students of a, a security master in the Netherlands uh, from the uh, Kirchhoff's Institute, and it's about 100 students that are going to be issued smart cards that they can use in a number of scenarios that I will show you in the next slide, and some 20 people of the, the staff. Um, and because we want the users to actually um, use this card uh, as much as they can so we can get experience with what it does, um, we've devised a number of use cases. One of them is that they can get uh, a reduced price for software that they purchase in our online store. Um, some of you may have seen the presentation by some of my colleagues yesterday. There is an online store that uh, um, a sister organization of Surfnet has where you can purchase software at a reduced price, and we're giving a reduction on the reduction. So it will be really cheap for students to buy software there, and we're hoping that they're going to use the cart for that. Um, they will also have access to some course-related materials. They will be able to grade their teachers without running the risk that their teacher know who gave that really horrible review about um, some course that they taught. Uh, and we're also going to have some offline scenarios. So they're going to be able to get uh, a reduction on the price of coffee in, uh, at several teaching locations. And we ha made a deal with the um, caterers on, uh, on the premises, that, and they will be handing them uh, these tablets to, uh, as a verifier device, and then students can show their card, and if they have a student credential on there, they will get a, about 50 cent reduction on a cup of coffee. Um, and also, uh, students pay for printing, uh, normally in, in most institutions in the Netherlands, and we're going to offer students free printing uh, if they uh, have one of these cards. And obviously, if there are any suggestions in the room of how we could use this technology, um, please step up uh, to me afterward and let me know. Now, this project has generated a lot of external interest. Um, uh, it's been running for about a year. Uh, and during this time, we've organized a number of public meetings where we invited not just our institutions to attend, but also outside organizations like government organizations and businesses. Uh, and we've seen a broad interest from both business as well as government users. Um, for instance, our Ministry of Internal Affairs is seriously interested in this technology as an alternative way to introduce an electronic identity card. Um, the tax office is interested because they need to authenticate users uh, when they are filling in their tax returns. Uh, our um, equivalent of the Department of Motor Vehicles uh, is interested in including this kind of technology on uh, driver's licenses. Um, and actually, some of the work that we've been doing recently, for instance, the, the integration of the technology in the point of sales terminals has been funded by our Ministry of Internal Affairs. So that shows that they are seriously committed to this technology. Um, I want to wrap up by um, talking a little bit about the future work that we're going to do. Because as I said before, it's very much an academic project at the moment. We're running a pilot. Uh, and one of the issues that we currently have is that anonymous, privacy-friendly credentials are very difficult to revoke. Because how do you trace the user when you spend so much time making the user untraceable? And that's actually a very hard problem, but it's not uh, a problem that, that can't be solved. We're looking at ways to um, revoke credentials in such a way that the user only becomes identifiable when his or her credentials have been revoked. So if it's a legitimate credential that's not been revoked, um, the untraceability properties uh, are guaranteed. But if the credential is revoked, then the user uh, becomes identifiable. And that's actually a property that, property that you would want to have. Another issue is interaction with the user. Um, as you saw, I, I use one of these tablets. I use an internet browser, and it shows which kinds of uh, att attributes are going to be revealed about me, for instance, the fact that I'm over 18. How can a user trust this device? And that's actually a big problem. And we are looking at things like trusted execution environments to uh, see if we can make that more secure. And finally, we want to perform a larger pilot. 
So we are now looking at um, uh, setting up a pilot where we have something in the order of thousands of users uh, and we're hoping to uh, um, at least organize the pilot before the end of this year, uh, although we're unsure whether we can actually start this year because it takes a lot of work to organize such a large, large pilot. So to conclude, um, what I've shown you is that privacy and strong authentication, because I'm using a very strong token, I'm using a smart card, uh, can go hand in hand with privacy. The two are not mutually exclusive. And actually, what I've shown you that authentication does not require identification. And that is a, a change of mindset for the people that do identity and authentication. And interestingly, the attributes that we've been using in federations for um, the last 10 to 15 years um, have the future because we're not going to be using them only in federations. We're also going to be using them on smart cards in offline scenarios uh, to prove our identities. Finally, this technology is very promising, but it's still an academic project. It needs to be taken to the next level, and we are working on that with our partners to make sure that this technology can uh, assure the identity of users in a privacy-friendly way in the next three to uh, five years. Um, and with that, I conclude my presentation. I would like to point you to um, our website, www.ermacart.org. Um, the slides are up on the Internet to um, meeting website, so if you uh, want to go and have a look, click on that link. Um, that shows you some of the uh, um, pilot use cases. It shows you some of the scientific background, some of the cryptography, if you're interested in that. Uh, and it also has a number of uh, longer introductions to the technology. If there are any questions, please come up. I'm glad there's some antidote to Google's uh, taking away everybody's privacy, but maybe they'll just buy you guys and that'll be the end of that. But uh, anyway, that was good. Um, I didn't quite follow how it works in a uh, offline scenario. It's got to talk to all the databases. So, I mean, other than the fact that you've got a picture there, I don't see how it would work in offline. Okay. In an offline scenario, so the, the terminal, in this case the tablet, um, will know which issuers are valid issuers of attributes, of identities. Uh, and, all, uh, and all credentials on the smart card have a digital signature. Uh, and during the showing process, I will show that I have the attributes and I will also show that I have a digital signature from an issuer on these attributes. And the digital signature is checked by the terminal. It doesn't need to be online to do that. Uh, so all it needs is to be up to date and have the latest issuer certificates on here, but that's all it needs. So it's completely offline. Yeah, so you just cache all the right stuff that you need. Sorry? You cache all the things you need. On yes, the you do, yeah. Any other questions? You mentioned this earlier in your, in your presentation that one of the goals that you were trying to solve with this otherwise really clever technology is um, to introduce user consent in what attributes they reveal. Yep. And uh, it seems like that's something you don't quite solve with this. Um, so have you considered looking into uh, perhaps issuing separate cards for identifiable attributes versus non-identifiable attributes, or incorporating additional hardware into the card so that the user can, at the time of the verification, control what attributes to reveal? Okay. Well, the, um, first of all, the user interface here on the, on the device shows you which attributes are going to be revealed. It's, it's the, the over 18 in this case. Um, the user can check afterward that that was revealed. And in most scenarios, for demonstration purposes, I've taken out the pin verification uh, in, in this case because it would take too long if I have to type on this. But normally, the user would have to make a conscious effort. So the user would have to do something before anything is revealed. The user would have to enter their pin, which is um, actually their consent. Um, also, all the attributes that are revealed from the card are those that are shown on the display. And the user can check this afterwards. So even if I have identifying attributes and non-identifying attributes on the same card, um, there is a guarantee that only those attributes that are shown are revealed. So there is no reason to separate the two on, on separate devices. 
uh, the user will know what is revealed and the user can check afterwards what has been revealed. Does that answer your question? Uh, partially. Uh, in an offline scenario, that would definitely be a case. In the uh, online scenario, if the verification page is hosted by the service provider, the uh, relying party in your terminology, uh, then the relying party could conceivably uh, lie to the user and say that it only ah. requests certain subset, yeah. whereas in reality yeah. it requests more. Well, we've taken that into account. Um, every relying party um, will receive a, a card ver what we call a card verifiable certificate. So the relying party will uh, uh, have some sort of policy issued to them which attributes they can request. And that statement is sent to the card during verification, checked by the card, um, and that is the information that, is, that will be displayed to the user. And that's actually the open issue I mentioned at the end. We want to assure that what is shown to the user is what is actually being revealed, but the card has a means to check if the relying party is actually authorized to request these um, attributes. I understand. Thank you. So I want, <clears throat> I'd like to piggyback on that last question. And, and just as context, um, um, I'm working on a project here in the US funded by NSTIC, and actually we're talking about it tomorrow, that's using anonymous credentials um, very much in, in the same fashion that uh, Roland's work is, is, is proceeding. Uh, a different form factor in that the credential is not on a card, it's either on a device or in the cloud, but otherwise um, it's a mix of um, the IBM technology and Microsoft has a similar uh, activity in this space. And in a moment of serendipity, I think some of our work is complementary to what Roland is doing and addresses the real-time consent questions that where is that question. Yeah, uh, the real-time consent stuff. So we will be putting a privacy manager into the flow so that the users have consent. Independently of Roland's work, we had settled on the same concept of what we call certification marks for applications, about them being compliant with policies. Uh, we've done this with the R and S category now inside um, in common, and we're trying to generalize that. So um, I think we're at the dawn of a new capability within the identity realm of fusing these anonymous credentials with federated identity. Um, in order for our work to, to happen, um, we need to have um, all of this happen in metadata. Metadata is sacred to us. Metadata is exactly what's being cached on, on the device in response to your question, Dan. It's the signing keys that you need to uh, validate all of this stuff. So um, stay tuned. Thank you, Ken. Any other questions? We have about two minutes left. Okay. Thank you very much.